Here we go. We are live, and uh, this is a very special live. We've changed our time on this from our normal <laughs> four o'clock because we have Dwayne Evans with us, and Dwayne is uh, <coughs> Dwayne is an hour um, ahead of me, so we had to change that a little bit, and uh, we wanted to make sure he's got some daylight to work in. Dwayne has got lots and lots and lots and lots of experience <laughs> with a sawmill, and he is going to take us today through everything sawmill, um, cutting, drying. And um, so instead of me talking, Dwayne, why don't you introduce yourself and then to talk a little bit about what it is that you're going to do today. Okay. I'm Dwayne Evans, um, owner of D. Cheney Company Woodcrafter and maker of Slab Stitcher. Um, and here at home base, we make lumber. Uh, we cut lumber for people that have trees that have been taken down in their front yard, backyard, fields, um, or they haul logs to us and we mill them into a lot of utility lumber um, and woodworking lumber. So we do have a maple log. Go ahead. How, how long now, Dwayne? When did you first start? milling your own stuff 99 bought the alaskan lumber mill and a used chainsaw and started collecting logs and back aches and aspirin so, <laughs> um quickly realized that a bandball mill was going to be my best bet as a hobbyist uh so we called woodminer and bought an LT15 and ran that up until 2014 when we decided to do it as a profession. Um, and we got the LT40, which is idling in the background because it's 32 degrees and that diesel doesn't like to start. Um, so we thought we'd kick it off. Um, and is that number... Also is that number on the sawmill your capacity then is 14 your diameter 40 is your diameter no i'm not sure where they get their numbers from because the lt15 and the lt40 both have the same throat capacity and the same blades i don't oh. know much about the other machines i've never owned them um but i think they're roughly in that 28 and a half or 28 inch wide throat capacity um, until you step in wider options. Um, there is an LT15 wide. Um, that one will do 35 and a half inches wide. Uh, mm. We do that for slabbing or even breaking down bigger logs to do the hydraulic mill. And how many, uh, how many board feet of uh, lumber do you think you've got in a year? Oh, it varies. Um, we're probably in the thirty to forty thousand board foot. Wow. Um, yeah, it's we get called in for for four trees. We called in for seventy five trees. Um, and you do we've done you do go remote in addition to cutting on your own site. You'll go to I the do. customer, right? The beauty of this LT40 is it does hook up right to the truck, pull up the outriggers, condense everything, and you're off and, and running. Um, with this type of mill with monorail, you don't need to be completely level. Um, so it, it really helps when you're doing mobile um, because not everybody's site is really sawmill friendly. So. Yeah. Um, this thing could adapt a lot better than a four post for mobile. Okay. Well, why don't you why don't you go ahead and take us to the log, and, okay. and talk us through what you're thinking? <laughs> unless that's really scary, but you know, <laughs> to tell us. Uh, Dwayne and I have been friends for a long time, so I, it's quite yeah. possible I'll yank his chain a little bit today. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, tell us what um, your, about your process. Well, um, Hayden, see if my son is behind the camera. We're trying to stay in signal. So we're going to push the limits of the Wi-Fi here. 
and see if we can get some of this detail. You have a good um, shot now. Okay. Um, this is actually a maple log with ambrosia, this stripe from a bug. This bug creates a fungus. Fungus is meant to feed their young. Um, it is an appealing lumber. Um, so something like this, I'm going for character. I want to see my first couple of boards are going to be with the most amount of ambrosia that this log has. Um, we already start cutting it. We leveled out the heart. Um, we took the heart section and we got the same distance from the bed on both ends of the log. So we're cutting directly with the grain of this log. Um, we did take a cut, couple cuts already. This one has some curl in it, but it's not going to show up right, right yet. There's some light curl up to here. That curl will show up a little bit more when it dries. Um, <clears throat> Over on what we call the sticker rack is what we were processed this morning. That's some uh, white oak posts for a hog barn. Mm. Um, being in a farming community, we do a lot of fence posts, fence boards, ends. Uh, we have done an entire barn already. Um, that was that 75 tree job. Um, and most of my customers have a cut list um, that we can conform to. Um, but for the most part with this log sitting here, I'm just going for character. Um, I'm not chasing a certain size. This will go into our lumber stock, uh, for future projects, depending on the grain, um, charcuterie boards or a small cabinet or something like that. And I think let's go back so, to that. Um, you were talking about basically le not leveling the log, but leveling the pith. And I, when I teach logs to lumber, I talk about this a lot and I, people yeah. struggle with it a little bit. I think it's, you have to work on that sawmill to make sure that you're cutting parallel to the center of the tree from a growth perspective, which may not be physically the center of the log so that yeah. Your, all your cuts are parallel to the grain and you don't end up with uh, short grain. Yeah, it, it's, it becomes much more user friendly once it's dry and once you're using it in the shop. Um, you'll notice once you get it in the shop after it's dry, whether you air dry or you kiln dry, if that lumber starts to open up or pinch tight, um, it was cut a little bit out of skew. Um, from that heart through the grain in, in an awkward um, cutting fashion. Uh, but there's a couple of other things that can lead to that tension, not just having it off off this heart. Um, that's a huge attribute, shooting for that heart, especially when you go to do quarter sawing. Um, a lot of the customers that are woodworkers in the area do request quarter saw and white oak, red oak, um, not from the stability of it, but from what oak looks like when it's quarter saw. But um, we thought we might run this blade through this maple while we have it running. Um, if that works. All right, hit it. Yeah, hit All it. All right, I'm going to drop. I'm going to drop the headphones so you guys don't hear this diesel running. All right, I'm back. <laughs> I am, boy, am so, I amazed at how quickly that buzzes 
through. And this log has been sitting here for a while. <laughs> George and I have tried to get this um, live up for a couple of months, and this thing's been sitting a little bit longer than it should. Um, the outer core of this log is actually dry, so it's fighting that blade a little bit. Um, but you can see the ambrosia. Let me get closer to the camera because I don't want to get the camera closer to the mill. Um, you can see a little bit of that ambrosia. Um, and if we had some sunlight today, uh, you'd be able to see that curl. But, um, yeah, these, these fan mills, especially with a diesel motor on it, they're built for production. Um, and then, are you cutting... Off. So what do you normally, is that it looks like you're cutting to an inch to four quarter? Is that this, you know, do this you one I'm doing five I'm quarter. cutting four quarter or is it depends? It all depends. A lot of stuff that we cut is four quarter. A lot of the woodworkers want four quarter. Fence boards are four quarter around here unless they're doing steer pen or stallion. Uh, they usually want something that's a five quarter. I've also had requests for six quarter um, on some hog pens. Um, we'll be cutting hog boards later on this afternoon. Uh, that'll all be five quarter. And then talk us through. So on the mill now, you've made another cut. You want to come down and do another four quarter board. What? Are you controlling that where you have to dial that down a perfect inch? Are there stops on the mill? Like, how does that work for uniformity? Yeah. Well, this mill here set up with a computer. It's basic computer setup. Um, it knows where the head is now. now. I can tell that computer I want it to cut a four-quarter board, which is an inch for the lumber and an eighth inch for the blade. So I'll set that computer at an inch and an eighth, and it'll it'll go from the cut I just made down an inch and an eighth. Um, and then after I go through the cut, as long as I don't go down, if I come up to go back through the log, it'll index again from that previous cut and go down another inch and an eighth. Um, and we can dial that into the sixteenth of an inch. Um, if a customer wants five quarter, six quarter, eight quarter, um, if we are doing some slab work on here, we'll do some 12 quarter. Um, now, the machine that's over in the distance, um, the LT15, that's more manual. That has a magnet that is movable, so you can reference your cut, your current cut, and you move that magnet strip. And you can line it up with your four quarter, five quarter, six quarter to eight quarter on that machine. Um, that's more of an entry level machine. Um, we bought that just because it had a wider throw capacity um, for what we needed. Um, the machine in the background, the Avant, um, is rated to load logs that will fit that other sawmill. Um, if I went any bigger with a sawmill, I'd have to go bigger with a loader. Um, and there's more money in loaders than sawmills around here. <laughs> yeah. and then it picks things up and puts it down. The um, We talked at the start about working off the pith of the tree um, from, a, yeah. from a grain perspective. But that's part of the tree you don't want, right? So yeah. is that correct that you want to eliminate that? From your final you want to, lumber? Yes. That's where the most of the tension is. Um, you do want to get rid of it, cut around it. If you're cutting a log to grade, or you're turning the log trying to get the cleanest of cuts, um, you, can, you can scale it to get rid of that heart. Or um, some people do use a term like boxing the heart. Well, they'll constantly be rotating the log to get even pressure off the log. Um, and then they'll just get rid of that heart section. 
and it's and leaving it in. I mean, that's the part that if people inadvertently leave that in, you're going to get a lot of checking and cracking around that, right? Yes, and most every tree has what they call wind shake, and that wind shake stems from that heart. Um, so you get a lot of cracking. I don't know, um, Hayden, if you can follow me over here. We have a cross section um, that we should be able to see. <laughs> um, this is that heart. Hayden, can you zoom in here? Thanks, buddy. Um, but you've got this cracking, this wind shake, um, and that's your heart. If you, if you would keep that lumber, you're going to have a bunch of cracks and shakes. And, um, when we quarter saw, we actually do cut this out of the final lumber, um, when we run it through the edger. Um, but this is a nice size cross section of a lumber that just came in that we did quarter saw the remainder of it. Um. I don't know why it has that much tension, but it is the nastiest piece in that log to work with when it comes oh. to lumber. And then, so let's go back to the log you have on the mill and just give us, you're plane sawing that right now or through and yes. through cutting. Yeah. And what's, so talk us through, I mean, on that log, did you pick that cut, like first, I guess, define for everybody plain saw on, and then did you pick that for a reason on that particular log? Um, I'm try I'm plain sawing this, which means I'm coming down and making sequential cuts down through this log um, for two reasons. Um, one, speed. It's one of the fastest ways to mill a log. And two, with it having the ambrosia and the curl, I want to get as much yield out of this log as I can. Um, this is going to be used for um, some fancier stuff once this curl comes out. Um, so if I would have squared this up and made these two cuts and square this into a cant, I would have lost all of this. Um, and in a curly log, um, your curl is actually out in the outer part of the tree more than it is on the inside. But we want to yield oh. as much as we can on the width of this log. And and curl comes from the tree being under compression somehow, right? <sighs> that like that, I don't know. You know, it was slightly blown by the wind, or it was bending away from the crown of another tree, trying to find sunlight or something. Is that? There's, Do I have that right? We've had discussions. Me and a couple other woodworkers have had this discussion. I don't think there's any scientific pinpoint of why an entire tree does curl. Mm. Um, I've noticed through cutting that maples, anytime you have a limb project out of a tree, that you'll have that compression curl in what I call the armpit. Um, from it holding that branch up every year, um, I'm thinking it's got to have something to do with the cell structure. And it's one of the viewers would know better. Um, but it, it seems to happen a lot in a soft maple than a hard maple, which would tell you that the cell structure is not strong um, so that it could give. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it has something to do with leaf canopy, where the trees grow in couple tons of leaves every year and it's squatting during that that summer growth period and it releases those leaves and springs up and then in the spring when it grows a little bit faster um it grows in a little bit of a different direction not quite sure but it looks beautiful in a finished piece and did you know just when that log was still a log could you tell it had curl from the outside once the once the bark started to come off um, we do not have that much sun here. Um, Hayden, can you swing around here? Um, I'm going to try to point it out. You can see a little bit of the deflection of the curl in the ripples on the side of this log. Um, sometimes when you pull the bark off, you can see it in bark, but I don't see it on this side. 
Um, when the early morning sun hit this thing, the breaking light, this thing, this curl just popped. Um, so they do give you some signs on the outside, but I've never seen it be on, on the outside of the park. There usually has to be a peel of the park to see that curl. Hmm. And you're, I know you're set up to also then. So now we got plane sawing off of this one. And I know you have a, a visual aid to show us quarter saw. Do you want to yes. do that now? Or do you want to, do you want yeah. to make another cut? What do you, it's all no, about you, buddy. What do you want to do? <laughs> we'll go up here. I have two hours to make this sample. Let's show it off. <laughs> all right. Um, you better look at it then. We're, we're, we're going to try to go up as far away from the Wi-Fi. This is the quarter sun sample that I had done this morning. Um, this would be the first cut was skimming the top here. Um, and then I come down into here, into the midsection, where this grain is going 80, 90 degrees to the face of the cut. And I made this cut to get into the quarter saw, number two, and then we came and did number three, and number four and number five. And you can really see um, the fleck. Of course, it dried. Um, we'll show it off in another piece. Um, but once I get to this section, this whole half round, I would have had a hunk. This upper section would have been left over from making cut two, three, four, and five. We put this piece, this chunk, which looks like this one. We put this on the mill and we turn it 90 degrees and we taste that grain again being 80 to 90 degrees to the cut. Um, and hey, if you can swing around here, we're seeing a little bit of that fleck on that quarter on oak. Um, and then we're left with a pie shape, which looks just like this guy here. And then we'll put it on the mill in an angle. And we'll cut these pieces 80 to 90 degrees to the growth of the, uh, the growth rings. So this is, this is a great visual because, well, let me, let me jump back a little bit. So with those wide boards, which are quarter sawn boards from the center of the log, what makes yes. that work as quarter sawn is that that grain on either side of the pith, the annual rings are giving you that angle that you keep referring to the 80 to 90 degrees to the face. And that so those yep. can just be cut as planks. But as you work your way down on that half round that's on the ground now, you would get to where those annual rings are starting to become more circular and not yeah at, not at the right angle relative to the face anymore. Yeah, we were almost 90 degrees here in this eye, uh, right in here. But we were starting to drift out and we were going to start to lose that fleck look on the face. Yeah. Um, and that's when we decided to turn it and start cutting which would be in this direction then for that band saw come this way and then get these two pie shapes. This is not the only way to quarter saw. There is a couple different versions. This is a version that works for me. For the most part, I'm a one man show unless my customers come. Um, they are invited to help turn their logs into lumber. Um, but this, this process works well for us. Now, we won't leave these boards this wide. This, like you were saying earlier about the, the heart of pith. And you see that. We'll get the most dynamic. We'll get. Um, so st stay where you are, but give us the, give us the talk through on the pith again. Cause you, you broke up real bad, right? at that. Sorry. Second. All right. Okay. Hey, stay right there. Um, in the center here, it's actually, 
you can kind of see this dark brown. That's more of a decay. This log has been sitting at the customer's lot a little too long. But this is that pit. This is that troubled grain, tension grain area um, that we will eventually put this on the edger and cut this section out um, and throw it into the firewood pile and then save that perfect quarter saw and board. They'll end up being about eight, nine inches wide. Yeah. And I, this is such a great, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this because it's such a great visual with regard to, so around here, I'm in Wisconsin, quarter sawn material is about twice as much per board foot as plain sawn. And yeah. boy, does that show you why. I mean, the labor yeah. aspect, you know, going from the maple log where it's just laying on the mill and you're boom, 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 and done. I'm oversimplifying. But where <laughs> to get that quarter sawn, you make a cut, you move the log, you make a cut, you roll the log, you make a cut. The, and then to get those um, quadrant pieces out. And somewhere in there, it's like the whole quarter sawn versus riff sawn thing. And I could never keep track of which is which. But um, when you're going after those pie shaped pieces, that's crazy labor intensive. And and the yes. pieces end up being real narrow. So you're, yes. is your yield inherently lower than two with quarter sawn? You're losing about 25% more than what if, if you just had plain sawn or you squared it up and made it into dimensional lumber. Um, because it took, now I was taking pictures this morning, but there's, there's about an hour's worth of labor into what is sitting there. And we're still not done. We have one whole semicircle yet to cut, the pie yet to cut. And everything has, still has to go through the air. Now, we could put it back on the band mill. Um, we could sister or, or stack together the, the pieces that are closest in uh, width and gang rip them on the band mill. But with us having the ability to have this twin blade edger, uh, we can just dial in the, the width that we need and force the board through it, and it comes out the width at one. Um, but it... Around here, I can make lumber for a customer uh, in the 35 to 50 cent a board foot range. When you do quarter sawn, it's in the 80 cents to a dollar a board foot. But like you said, quarter sawn lumber is usually twice the price. Um, we just got done with a 2,500 square foot quarter sawn job that will be turned into flooring. Um, and everything, it was three and a half days instead of just a day and a half. Hmm. So the log behind you that you started quartering, if you just threw that on the mill and plain sawed the whole thing, what would yep. cutting time be? You're looking at less than a half an hour. Holy buckets. And then, and if you quarter saw it, well, you're already an hour in, so like four times that. Yeah, you're you're probably an hour and a half with another guy be able to pull the lumber off. You're probably an hour and a half in quarter sawing that log. <clears throat> wow. Um, it works out well if we bring the edger over. Once we cut piece, we can throw it right through the edger while the sawmill's cutting another board. It one's going through the edger, <clears throat> and then. Because you threw some pricing out there, I'm going to hit on that a little bit. That this is a good thing for yeah. people to know that the closer you can get to the source, the less expensive the thing can be. So, yeah. if they can find a Sawyer in their area, they can buy direct from. But the other side of that, of course, is everything that's leaving you. I mean, as we're talking about it here, it's leaving green right there. Yeah, you know, they can't. They're not taking that stuff into their shop and working with it. You're cutting, but we haven't even started on drying. Talking about drying yet? Yeah, yeah. Everything leaving here green. Um, the only thing that gets used almost immediately is fence parts. Um, some guys will dry their posts before they put them in the ground, but most of the time the boards are going from sawmill 
right on the fence post. Um, everything else has to go into the drain cycle. Um, and we can start talking about that um, if you like. Yeah, let's do that. And it's so just to hit back on this for people who are watching, um, you heard Dwayne talk about a couple of prices there. And I've experienced the same thing here back when I still had a hobby farm and I was making uh, fence rails for horses, making a round pen. Um, I bought all that material straight from a green, straight from a sawmill. And it was oak, but it was crazy and expensive because I was getting it straight from the source. And of course, if you want to bring that into your shop and use it, you've got to you've got to go through the drying process. But it's a good way to save some money on your hobby um, if you can buy it green straight from a mill. But then to use it, it does need to be dried. There's your segue, drain, Dwayne. So um, <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about your drying process. Okay. Being that most of the time I'm a one-man show, over here is what we have built. We call this sticker rack. Um, it sits on my side of the sawmill. Um, probably getting some feed from this. Let me shut this mill off. I have the blessing to have dust collection on my sawmill. So... Um, but this is the sticker rack. So when I'm cutting lumber here, I can literally grab a board, turn, put it on the rack, grab stickers from underneath here. These are four footers. I don't need four footers, but we can go every, I usually go every foot on a common log um, and so on and so on to create that air space so that the air can go through and wick that lumber off of the, or wick the uh, moisture out of lumber. Um, these are all gonna be hog pens. So I'm just stickering them so they don't get moldy by the time the guy needs to use them, but he's gonna be putting up in two weeks. Um, from this point, we usually do strap them um, and then we will move them over to our drying area we have um, a tenant area, and we also have some barn space that we rent from the neighbor. Uh, you want to keep that. You want to keep the rain off them. Um, so we usually try to get something out over. We have some piles of degraded lumber that we don't worry about covering. We use that for utility stuff outsider. Um, but once it air dries, there's there's a lot of different opinions about drying. What works for me is I will stack and sticker it for 6 to 12 months, get it down to that 20% moisture, then I will ship it off to a kiln, have the kiln guy get it down um, to 10 to 12%. Um, I'm shooting for 10%. And then we will store that stuff in the upstairs uh, section of the barn until we're ready to use it. Um, there are some different versions of kilns. Uh, I think a lot of the people out there have heard about this, the I dry vacuum kiln. People are cutting lumber green, stacking it, stickering it, putting it right in the I dry kiln. And I don't know what the drying times are up for that, but I think it's around three weeks, two weeks to three weeks for four quarter for green to, to dry lumber which is unbelievable. Um, but you're to the, I mean, stuff that you're cutting is going into your use, right? I mean, you're air drying your, like your slab stitcher. Um, yes. Bow ties are the raw coming material. off of your air dried stuff. Is that right? Yeah. And especially we use a lot of walnut. Um, and walnut is one of those woods that the longer it air dries, the richer the color is. So we will push the, the walnut to air dry a few more months longer than the um, maple or the cherry that we use. The cherry can also benefit from more air drying. Um, it seems like if you take walnut and cherry from a sawmill right into a kiln, it seems to diminish that richness in the color, creates a, a pale 
Cherry. Um, but then cherry color differs from region to region. So I've got pink, so I've got dark red. Um, and I, I'm going to double up on what Dwayne just said there. If you've never seen air dried cherry and air dried walnut, you are you are missing out. Air dried walnut is almost purple. <laughs> it's got this incredibly rich color, and it is. And if you think about it, it makes sense that when you put it in a kiln, you're baking it, and yeah. that heat is going to, it's just naturally going to bake some of that cool color out. And same, same with cherry. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth looking for air dried in those two. You don't, you really don't see it in a oak or something like that as dramatically as you see it in walnut and cherry. And so, so for you, you're in Pennsylvania. Um, so what's your drying, what's drying time for you? To get that stuff usable um it's usually right around four to six months for one inch thick to get down to that 20 percent, and then a three-week kiln cycle in a dehumidification kiln um like a flooring job that we started last month um he has a deadline of march wanting to put this lord down in his house um and we're going to be pushing that limit we're going to be in that That's four tight. to five month. Yeah. Um, but we've had dry um, months. We haven't had a lot of rain. This lumber is already shrinking to the point in three weeks that the straps are loosening up, which is a good sign. I got to retighten the straps. Um, but we should be able to keep him on point with this floor. Um, but back, touching back with the walnut, I've never. I haven't bought commercial walnut in, well, probably forever. Um, but have you dealt with this steamed walnut where I, I'm not 100% sure of all the details, um, but I think they're trying to bleach out that um, really neat purple and get it into the sapwood, well, kind of uh, even out the color toes? Yeah, so not with walnut, but with cherry, um Quite a while ago, I was a production manager of a commercial cabinet shop where we built old Navy store or uh, Banana Republic stores that were all cherry. And we we tried some steamed walnut for that. What it does is it makes the color more uniform because walnut and cherry both have the same problem, which is the heartwood is chocolate brown in walnut and the cherry is yeah. cherry colored. And then the sapwood is super, super blonde. So you can end yeah. up with a lot of waste because that sapwood adjacent to the heartwood creates a very distinct stripe that some people, I don't mind it, but some people don't want it. Um, so yeah. we, we bought some steamed cherry for that and it works. I mean, it made the color a little funky, like it wasn't quite the natural cherry color that um, you would normally see, but, but it worked. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me feed you some questions, Dwayne. Ready? Okay. Yep. So Paul asked um, two questions. Do I need to let a fresh cut slab sit for a certain amount of time before carving something in it? So that's question number one. And second question, what would you suggest as a sealant? So let's do the sealant first. I'm assuming he means an end grain sealer. What do you use yeah. for that? I, I use old exterior paint, either latex or oil base. Um, and I do use a commercial um, wax sealer uh, made by Anchor Seal. Um, my neighbor is a shed builder, so I get all the junk paint um, and can seal the ends of the logs. Um, Anchor Seal works great because I can put it in a backpack sprayer and spray it on a bulk load if I want. Or... If I have already cut the lumber, I can spray it. Trying to brush individual boards with latex paint is a pain in the tuchus. Yeah. Um, for carving on green wood, um, I don't know if I would carve on green wood. I would wait for it to dry. Yeah, I don't think... Uh, I'd want to get... I don't think you could get the detail in a green log... I mean, and I'm not a carver, but 
Um, Me either. But I don't think you could get the detail. And I'll, so I would say let that dry. And then I'm going to come back to our kiln versus air drying with this. The, um, a very good friend of mine was a carver and he would only use air dried basswood, not kiln dried basswood, because he said the, the kiln, just like we talked about with color, it would bake that wood Bakes. and make it harder. So Makes even though crisp. both are dry, the air dried basswood was way more malleable and easy to work with. And I know for people who are doing a lot of um, steam bending, they prefer to do that with air dried than kiln dried for the same reason that um, you have a piece that's way more workable, e even though they're both dry, the air dried is way more workable. And, right, my and then another big, question. Go ahead. My, my biggest fear was carving something into a wet piece of wood. Wood dries out and it seems to want to break apart on the face. If you're already starting to work it and your detail is carved in there, your detail is going to crack. Yeah. Um, so here's another one. How long is too long to mill logs? I have some white oak that's been laying in the woods for at least five years. <laughs> um, that's a trick question because that does depend on species. Um, the log that is behind me, the lumber that's behind me, that came in with a lot of punk on it, which is the the deteriorating outer edge, uh, the bark cambium layer and the sapwood. So I know this log's been sitting around for a couple of years, but once I got through that, Hayden, if you can come over here, um, this would have been that punk, this pail would have been that punk. I'm saving this just for this three by three section. Um, but once I got through that, I was into good solid oak. Um, in, a, in a white oak, um, they can sit for three, four, five years in the woods. You're just going to reduce your yield when you go to cut it. Um, if you're having a Sawyer come in, I would definitely pick lumber that's more fresh. But I would also put that stuff on mill as well because you can cut it with the band mill and see if it's good. It's better to put a bad log on a mill and see if the lumber is good than to start coming into firewood and realizing it was usable. Yeah. And I, I've been very pleasantly surprised. Um, I've got my little chainsaw mill and there's a lot of stuff where I run into where um, it's cool, but I can't get to it right away. And if it's yeah. someplace where it's not in direct sunlight and it can stay wet, um, the ends might go south because it starts to crack from the ends. But it's amazing how long the interior of a log will stay wet enough to not give you a real bad crack problem. But then it is, yep. like Dwayne said, that fine line. You know, somewhere in there, the wood maybe starts to spalt, which is cool when it gets black lines. And then somewhere spalting turns to rot and then it's not so cool. So yeah, um, it's a mixed bag. My camera guy's hands are cramping. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to be in Hollywood. Um, it is. It is. Plus it's 32 degrees here. His hands are getting a little bit cold. Um, well, somebody now, did comment the, about it, your, uh, somebody commented about your shorts <laughs> after Thanksgiving. <laughs> These, and, and, I wear shorts all year long. And the same guy said, uh, did they ask you to use this saw on Fargo too? So <laughs> I don't know if this is a Tom Red. I don't know if this is an inside joke. I don't know about it. No, no. But everybody that knows me knows I wear shorts all year long. It's got to dip down below 20 degrees for me to put some kind of coveralls on over my shorts. <laughs> But you probably won't see me wear pants. Um, back to the deteriorating log question. Um, white oak is a harder log than, say, uh, a maple or a poplar. If that poplar would have been sitting there five years, it would have been practically mulch. 
um, maple as well. I've had maple come in here and get buried in the pile um, by accident, working just through all the fresh logs, and then I get through um, a pile and I find a maple log and cut it, and it, it, it's just trash. Um, so, so Willie says, and we hit on this a little bit, but let's elaborate. Um, good morning, guys. When milling a log, whoop, it just jumped on me. When milling a log, is it best to dry the log before milling or dry the lumber after milling? So it's, we touched on this a tiny bit, but this is a great point that comes yeah. up a lot. It does. Um, you definitely want to cut the lumber and dry the lumber. I don't believe that moisture is ever going to completely get out of that log before that log starts to deteriorate. As that lumber log starts to dry, your outer part of that, the outer shell, if you will, um, is going to start to rot. Um, so you definitely want to slice it to your desired thickness um, and get it thicker and get it in the drying process. Yeah, so Willie, the answer to that is cut them green. Get to them as fast as you can, cut them green, and then dry lumber, don't dry logs. And with the, we talked earlier about sealing the ends. If you're not going to get to that log for a bit, paint the ends. Leave the bark on. Yeah. If the bark is on, leave it on because um, that'll help slow the drying process down. It'll act as a skin. And then the ends of a log, the ends of any piece of wood look just like soda straws or pop straws, depending on where you live. Um, and the water is going to evacuate out those ends as it starts, as it wants to dry. So yeah, paint, paint the end of the log while it's laying there. And the other benefit to that is wood cuts way easier green than dry. So when way I turn a bowl, <laughs> my preference is to turn bowls dripping wet green because I'm lazy and they, the wood cuts easier. Um, right off. Yeah. Margaret says, I can get some mesquite logs from mountains near Las Vegas, which will be small diameter for small turning projects. Any advice on how to dry wood in the desert climate? So I Ooh. think that, that's probably about too fast, right? That's probably the problem. I I would say it's, yeah, it's going to be too fast. Um, I have heard of people putting turn uh blanks into track bags have you done this george where it it they they want it to dry but they don't want it to dry too fast so they'll put it into a track bag and it will help hold the moisture um especially in the desert climate oh my gosh the, uh, i would expect that lumber to those those log sections to fracture quite quickly now yeah, especially i can't uh... A hard dead wood like mesquite is not going to be very forgiving for that. We don't get mesquite around here, so it's not something I can really talk too much about the lumber. Um, but that dry heat would really do a number on um, speeding up the drying process, which is yeah. not beneficial to, to lumber. Yeah, I would. So, Margaret, what I would say is is paint the ends with an end grain sealer. I use Rockler's end grain sealer. Um, end grain, Rockler's end grain sealer, anchor seal, paint, whatever you're going to use, seal the ends. And then my bolts, my turning stuff, I put in a paper bag, not a um, plastic bag, because the paper bag allows some breathability without, but allows it to dry at a slower rate. But all of this is... Uh, our, our our disclaimer is this is all experimental and uh, we don't don't hold us to it if the mesquite cracks on you because that's that's going to be tough um barry says i have an ash stump about 30 inches in diameter 24 inches tall i'm desiring to use it as a table when it is dried um i assume painting both ends is in order are there any other considerations I should be aware of? Oh, uh, I, I, I would... don't get if it's still 30 inches in diameter. Oh, so he wants to leave it as a stump. Yes, he's going to leave it as a stump. Yes. Um, I would take the bark off 
um, that's going to help it to dry. Um, but it's going to take years for that thing to dry. I've told people just move it into the house and use it as you'd want to. Yeah, I um, agree. I mean, if you think about um, a general rule for drying is one year per inch of thickness. And some, <laughs> some people will say plus a year. So if, Barry, you are 30 inches in diameter, that's a pretty long wait for a table. <laughs> yeah. 2052, um, you'll be good to go. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree with uh, – I agree with Dwayne on this one. I would, you know, cut the ends to where you want them to be and, and do the best you can to sand them smooth and um, start using it because, and, it, and it'll be interesting would, to watch, you know, if he doesn't say where he lives, but if he brings it into the house and some checking starts, it'll be kind of a cool conversation piece. Like, oh, when I was here a month ago, that crack wasn't in that long <laughs> and in your table. And now it is. So I would definitely put some blocking, some like decorative feet on the yeah. bottom so that the moisture that's trying to escape can can release and then not penetrate into the substrate of the floor, carpet, yeah. hardwood, whatever um, that it's sitting on. And then he says, he has to um, should it be kept in a garage and out of the elements. And yes, I mean. Yeah, the, the best drying environment is anything that's undercover um, with airflow. And so Jim says, and I think maybe in regard to the mesquite, I live in I live south of Las Vegas and I won't mill lumber during the summer because it dries too fast and cracks. So oh. yeah. yep. um Alice says, when turning green wood, I put the item in a plastic bag with sawdust to help prevent the turning from drying too quickly and cracking. Yeah, so a little bit of what we talked about. Just have it in a bag, reduce that, the rate at which it's uh, drying. Oh, Barry, so Perry has a good sense of humor. He says his grandchildren can argue over the ash table. Then. He's, in, <laughs> he's in Minneapolis, so he's not far from me. That's, that's going to dry this part of the country stuff dries kind of slowly because if yeah. it's outside, we don't get much drying in the winter time. Uh, Dean asks, what's the moisture content of green logs? My moisture meter only goes up to 30% and it pegs on green log. Um, I don't know, George, if you experienced it um, with a higher read on a moisture meter. My Wagner's only go 30 yeah, it's, um, I think as a, as a general rule, people will say um, it can be 30, it can be as high as 50%. And it's, it's interesting. The physics of that is interesting or the biology that what that means is the, the weight of the tree is then 50% water, 50% wood. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's somewhere off the scale at that cutting stage and um and that's you you need a moisture meter if you're going to mess with this you got to have a moisture meter so that you can know scientifically where you're at with this stuff not by guessing by golly somebody asked yeah, i think i rolled past the question yeah there it is how often do you have to change the blades on your sawmill depending on what i'm cutting um the average is about two and a half three hours uh to change a blade um these things these blades aren't cutting through clean lumber. Um, and, I, and I mean by that is I don't have a huge debarking setup. So when I'm cutting through a log, I'm cutting through dirt. Uh, dirt impregnates in the bark. Even on a standing tree for windstorm, dirt will impregnate into that bark. So I'm cutting through dirt and debris. Um, this LT40 does have a debarker attachment where it pre-scores, um, the cut. This little mode here will, will rotate in and pre-score and try to clean that up. Um, but on this side, you're still cutting through some stuff. So if I get three hours out of a blade, I'm happy 
but I'm not also I'm not running my blades till the perfectly dull because I resharpen all my own blades. So I'd much rather resharpen a blade that has um, some wear instead of when it's completely um, shot. If if my tension gauge moves while I'm cutting, that means that blade is getting hot and expanding and losing pressure. That blade has got to come up because you're going to end up stretching the blade out um, and it's going to be a lot harder to sharpen it, getting it back on the mill. Well, and then two, I think like using a bandsaw on your shaft, if, if the blade is dull, it's hard to cut a straight line because it wants to, it's flexing. It doesn't have any spine to it and it's, it's flexing away from the cut you're trying to make. Um, yeah. So it's going to affect, you're going to end up with snaky boards instead of flat boards. Um, yep. So Darrow's question is part of this. What prep work needs to be done to the log prior to sending it through a mill? And I used to, with my chainsaw mill, my first tractor was a narrow front, no front end loader. So I dragged all my logs to the mill and then I rolled them up a <laughs> ramp to get them on. So I power washed them before I cut them because who knows what I dragged that log through to get it to the mill. Um, and then once I switched to a tractor where I had a bucket and I could bucket load them, I didn't power wash so much anymore. But so for you, anything like that? I mean, you just, are you just lifting them on? I have some customers that think muddy days are the best days to drag their logs. And I show up and the side of these logs are just ached with mud. So in my truck, when I do mobile milling, I have a hatchet, um, a hammer with a straight claw, and a grinder with a cup brush that kind of is shaped like this. Um, and I will either, they're going to pay me, <laughs> to chip that that bark off or or run that grinder or i put it in their hands uh, because i'm charging by the hour i don't need to be sitting there dressing their dirty logs um but i'll do it um, because i don't have the convenience of grabbing a, a pressure washer um, but the cup brush does an amazing job of being able to get most of the debris off and i don't need to clean the entire log um, if I can orient that log where the, a lot of the debris is on the top, I can take a deeper uh, first cut and get rid of a lot of that debris. Hmm. Um, ben says 8 to 10% is best for wood dryness to keep it stable, correct? And I would say, yeah. Yes. I mean, kiln dried drives it to like 6 to 8% or so, right? So somewhere around in this area um in this area the ambient moisture content is 12 percent um inside of a house you are going to get into that uh 10 9 8 percent moisture um lumber that's just sitting in my wood shop is usually 10 to 12 percent um if i am building something that is um Oh, movement restricted. I will, yeah, that's the word. Um, I will actually take it into my house and let it sit in my house. We have actually stacked and stickered small piles of lumber next to our fireplace uh, for some things. <laughs> well, Dwayne, we're down to the last minute. So my question for you is, what's the like, maybe the weirdest thing you've ever hit with a bandsaw blade? And then I don't know. I mean, I don't know. That might be it right there. It's like you must have hit some metal and I don't know, concrete, T post, whatever. What's what's your <laughs> best what's your best for a concrete, story about hitting something with the blade? Concrete nail was the um the worst thing I've ever hit, believe it or not. Um it literally chopped the teeth off the blade. So when I made the, the chainsaw cut, the bandsaw had come into the log and hit the nail. I took a chainsaw and cut this way so I could break the chunk off. When I broke that chunk off, there was a pile of bandsaw teeth sitting there right next to the nail. Yeah. <laughs> the, na the nail won. Um, yeah. The nail had, had, had definitely won. Um, ceramic. 
uh, fence insulators. They'll stop a blade dead in its tracks. Um, my son's trying to tell me something. Go ahead, tell me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know why, but people put concrete in trees to heal the wound. Yeah. Uh, a Sawyer will hit that concrete. Um, um, the creepiest thing I've ever seen inside of a tree has to go to Doug out at Groff and Groff Lumber or Groff Lumber. Um, they cut open a tree and there was baby doll inside of the tree. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple wrap up questions and then I know because too we got to roll because Katie's got another event. Katie's behind the scenes yeah. that she's got to get to. Um, on mobile milling, you charge by the hour, not by the board foot, with the question mark. Yes. How much do you charge yes. per hour? I do charge $90 an hour. Um, I do have a 35 horsepower diesel on this machine. It cuts about th uh, 400 board foot an hour um, on a perfect log. Um, and I do charge a destination fee just to, because I have to take this mill and collapse it into my mobile mill to take it out. And then I bring it back and set it up in my yard. Um, and then for me, Daryl asked, George, with the chainsaw mill, do you debark before cutting? And I never did. I, I'd power wash it um, and then cut. And then... Um, Somebody's asking tips on chainsaw sharpening, but I think that's more that could go on um, for a really long time. That's more. Uh, <laughs> do it by hand. Do it by hand. Learn how to do it by hand. Wow. Okay. We can we can argue about that because I have a I take my <laughs> chains off and I sharpen them on a power sharpener. So. All right, Dwayne. Well, anything else hand. from? <laughs> Anything else, any other words of wisdom from Pennsylvania we should know about? Any closing closing comments about cutting wood, drying wood? Dude, you've been doing it a long time. You must enjoy it. I love it. I love it. I can still remember the first board I ever cut. It was a poplar log in my grandfather's woods with uh, an 076 steel chainsaw. Um, and one of the original Alaskan lumber mills. Um, I still have the chainsaw, um, and it's addictive. It's addictive. I, I want to see what's inside every tree. Yeah, it's, and I'm with you. I, uh, whether it's my chainsaw or, you know, free handling with my chainsaw, which I was doing right before we got on the air here, um, or on my bandsaw or on my chainsaw mill, Opening that log is still magic every time, and add a uh, add a gallon of water on that piece so you can see the grain better, and it's really even cooler. And I I missed a question from Bob here, so I'll take care of this one. Um, it's got an ash tree that died because of ash borer. Can you have it cut into slabs? Yes. So yes, that's in in my area. There's ash available everywhere. Because urban, the urban Same areas, here. they're cutting so many trees down um, that a lot of mills are cutting ash like nobody's business. Yeah, they're, it's a shame. They are literally a dying breed. Uh, the more I cut as a sawyer, the more I'm cutting ash. All right. All right, Dwayne. Well, thanks. Uh, and thanks, Katie, behind the scenes, as always, for keeping us moving and running and keeping everything working. And uh, thanks so much to Dwayne for giving us so much time and the log that he cut for us ahead of time. We'll see you folks for our live stream next in uh, January. Katie, punch us out. <laughs> see you, Katie! <laughs>